Hi folks, this is Abel James, and thanks so much for joining us on Fat Burning Man, where we help you look, feel, and be your best. Do you know what sugar really does to your brain? Dr. David Perlmutter is here this week to give you the scoop. Always a fan favorite on this show, Dr. Perlmutter is a board-certified neurologist and the author of international bestsellers Grain Brain and Brain Maker now available in 28 languages across the globe. Today on Fat Burning Man, you'll learn about intermittent fasting, what to do about ketosis, a simple tweak to your lifestyle to cut your risk of dementia by 50%, and much more. But first, here are a few updates that just came in from listeners. Allison just forwarded this one, which I love, from Joshua, who's got a big old picture of a green smoothie here. He's about to share his six lessons to help you get incredible results this year, and he's right on the money. So Joshua says, kicking off a wild 2017, the best way I know, with a big green smoothie. Since committing to the wild diet in January of last year, I've lost 45 pounds and feel better than I have in a long time. It was a bumpy year with some off days and occasional off weeks. Progress was fast at some times and slow at others. My top lessons learned. Number one, a bad day doesn't have to turn into a bad week. Number two, when weight loss stalls, and it will, Focus on being healthier instead of losing weight. Focusing on the number will lead to bad decisions and or unsustainable habits. Number three, almost all of my bad days came after bad sleeps. Track how much you sleep, how you feel, and your willpower, and I guarantee you will see a correlation. Number four, it's a long journey. Take your time and focus on making sustainable changes. Let that sink in for a second. That's that's a really good one. This is Abel speaking here. All right. Number five, learn to cook. It just takes practice. Pick some easy staples that you can rely on in a pinch. We do burgers and a whole chicken at least once a week. Number six, cook enough for leftovers. Cook double what you need for a meal so you always have some leftovers for the next few days. Good luck to everyone just sharing their journeys. I hope you feel as good next year as I do today. And that's from Joshua. Joshua, firstly, congratulations on dropping 45 pounds. That is not a small feat. It takes a lot of dedication to get there. You have to do the right things. Like you said, it's all about sustainability. Uh, How can you work the right foods into your lifestyle and your habits and do it every day. So your tips are spot on. This is a lifelong journey and we're here to help you guys. So thanks so much for sharing your lessons with our tribe. Now here's a quick note. If you wanna join the Fat Burning Tribe yourself, get all of our meal plans and share your success story and more, you can visit from any device, fatburningtribe.com. That's fatburningtribe.com. Here's another note that just came in from Lyra. Yahoo! In nine months, I lost 43.50 pounds. I have the wild diet to thank. If you told me when I was watching Abel on the ABC TV show that I would be down this much weight, I would have laughed at you. I find the diet works for me and my husband. Abel, I am so grateful to you, and I'm proud of myself for taking advantage of this diet. I have 20 pounds to go, and I'm confident I will make my goals. This is a lifestyle and I love it. Boom, nailed it. It's a lifestyle. Congratulations to you and your husband. We're proud of you. So keep in touch. We'll help you drop those last few pounds. If you made a resolution to finally get in shape in 2017, here are a few more tips that you might find useful to rock your resolutions this year with the Wild Diet. Numero uno, stay away from sugar and grains, especially in the morning to stay in fat burning mode. Ditch the fruit juice too, that orange juice, that apple juice, grape juice, what have you. Maybe a little bit post-workout or something like that, but it's, it's not the healthy breakfast staple that so many people think it is. Number two, upgrade the quality of your meats. Switch to grass-fed and pastured meat if you can instead of factory farmed. You'll be amazed by the difference in taste and it will make a massive difference to your health. Number three, be specific with your goals and make them positive. So instead of saying, I want to lose weight, say, I'm going to get back to my high school weight. It's all about framing it in a positive way. Number four, eat meals that look like the wild plate. It's really easy. Here's a good quick guideline. Make half your plate veggies that can be fresh or cooked. Add a palm-sized portion of protein and make sure to fill up on healthy fats like avocado, olive, coconut, and grass-fed butter, not vegetable oils, not processed oils like corn oil, soy oil, a lot of the restaurant type and fried oils uh, are the ones that you want to avoid. So avocado, olive, coconut, grass-fed butter, 
Those are some of my favorites. Check those out if you haven't already and you're just looking to dip your toes into this lifestyle. So put these tips and what you learned from Joshua into action and you'll be fit as a fiddle in no time. Before we get to the interview with Dr. Perlmutter, remember when you saw my client Kurt lose 50 pounds in six weeks on the ABC TV show? We'd like to show you exactly how we did it. If you want to get in the best shape of your life in 2017, we're inviting you to the Wild Diet 30-Day Challenge. You'll get all the tools you need to drop stubborn fat with delicious, real food. You'll even get the 30-Day Meal Plan featured on ABC TV, including wild chicken parmesan, cowboy burgers, and even chocolate pudding. No calorie counting, ridiculous workouts, or gloom required, I promise. If you're ready to start today, you can get instant access to our 30-day fat loss program for a limited time discount at fatburningman.com slash 30 days. That's the number 30, D-A-Y-S. From any device, your phone, uh, tablet, or computer, just type in fatburningman.com slash 30 days. We're also doing a lot more challenges in the fat burning tribe. So if you'd like even more community support, accountability, as well as coaching, go to fatburningtribe.com. Or if you just want to dabble a little bit and see if this is right for you, you can get a free wild diet quick start guide and seven days of meal plans just for joining my newsletter at fatburningman.com. So just go to fatburningman.com from any device, put in your email address, and I'll send you some free goodies to help you get started for free. And finally, be sure to tune into Fat Burning Man next week to get smart with the wonderful Dr. Kate Shanahan, the nutritionist for the Los Angeles Lakers who got Kobe Bryant, of all people, hooked on bone broth. Now, onto the show with Dr. David Perlmutter. You're about to learn why you shouldn't be afraid of dipping into ketosis, how much protein you should eat, here's a hint, it's much less than you think, how to reset your hormones and metabolism with intermittent fasting, and much more. Let's go hang out with the doc. All right, folks, returning to the show today is our friend, Dr. David Perlmutter. Dr. Perlmutter is a board-certified neurologist and fellow of the American College of Nutrition who specializes in preventative medicine and neurology. Dr. Perlmutter has contributed extensively to medical literature with publications in the Journal of Neurosurgery, Journal of Applied Nutrition, and Archives of Neurology. He's also the author of the international bestsellers Grain Brain and Brain Maker, which are available now in 28 languages across the world. You may have seen him on Oprah, Larry King, Dr. Oz, or The Today Show. I've been told he never leaves home without fresh avocados and sockeye salmon by the can. He even plays a mean guitar, ladies and gentlemen. Dr. Perlmutter, thank you so much for joining us. Abel, it's great to see you again. Good to see you too. So there is so much to talk about, but I, I dig your new book. It takes more of a lifestyle, holistic perspective on all this. But I'd like to point out first, and you mentioned this in your book as well, that some of your ideas at first might seem like they're a bit out there, especially when you first publish uh, your books, but all of a sudden science and research is catching up with it. You're starting to get a lot of traction. Why do you think that is? Well, that was the goal. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I didn't, you know, you don't want to write a book about the status quo. You definitely have to push the envelope. And if you're right, then that will help to move the ball down the field. You know, Ronald Reagan said that the term status quo means uh, is a Latin word for the mess we're in. And I agree with that. You know, we've got to improve things. So you know, back when Grain Brain was written, um, you know, we came out with these preposterous ideas that humans would be better off if we cut back on our carbs and sugar and maybe avoided gluten. Right. And look where we are now. I mean, you know, the U.S. Uh, dietary guidelines came out and said, as a matter of fact, our biggest threats to threat our health uh, from a dietary perspective are, in fact, sugar and carbs, not fat anymore, not even saturated fat anymore. Boy, who knew that? Yeah. The, the next book, Brain Maker, was, uh, I think, you know, an early experience in what was going on relating our gut bacteria to our health. And people raised their eyebrows when that book came out as well. And now, you know, you look at all the research dealing with the microbiome. Every day there's, you know, 10 new powerful articles that are coming out. So, so you're right. You know, I, I do try to be a little bit prescient in, in what I look at. But... Um, Ultimately, the goal is to explore these things in a way that they will lead to uh, people getting information that they can then adopt and make lifestyle changes that can leverage this leading edge science and then turn their lives around and really change their health destiny. 
Yeah. And even the government is coming around, as it turns out. But the thing that surprised me about that is, is when the government, uh, you know, does a complete 180 on on something you might see it in the news for a week or so then it fizzles out and most people don't wind up hearing about it right so when so so when fat all of a sudden isn't quite as vilified even by the traditional establishment most people don't realize it it takes a lot of time to kind of undo that that damage that's been done by misinformation being out so long this is a terrible pun but those ideas are ingrained in people uh and you know the fat phobia uh that really entered the uh uh, our mentality three decades ago, now we've learned, uh, based upon a really powerful study appearing in the Journal of the American Medical Association, that the, the forces behind the vilification of fat uh, were brought to, to bear by the sugar industry in the late 1960s, uh, trying to find a scapegoat so that sugar and carbs would be looked upon as being good for us, and they chose fat. And uh, that was front page New York Times and I think that that move, uh, by its effect upon shifting uh, the the broad stroke dietary choices in Western countries, not just America, right. probably had uh, more effect in terms of mortality than World War One and World War Two combined. Because that type of diet paves the way for chronic degenerative conditions, uh, the Alzheimer's, coronary artery disease, cancer, diabetes that the World Health Organization now ranks as the number one cause of death on the planet. So that's what that little move uh, by the sugar industry actually ended up doing. And it's for people like ourselves these days to do our very best to right that wrong, light the single candle, not curse the darkness, and really indicate that, you know, by the way, the diet that we've been eating for over two million years has worked and continues to work. And we're not going to scientize our food and make us better. So, you know, the notion is we've got to understand that our food choices are interacting at an intimate level with our genome. And that's been going on a long time. Food is more than macronutrients of fat, carbohydrates, and protein, and the micronutrients, the vitamins and minerals. Food is information and as such is intimately interacting with our genome moment to moment causing changes in gene expression, a science that we term epigenetics. And these can be detrimental changes towards our health, which we are seeing based upon the standard American diet, or we can amplify health and turn on pathways that reduce inflammation, that augment antioxidant production and enhance detoxification based upon that powerful medium of information called food. So it's really a different way of looking at our food. And that even doesn't begin to touch the notion of food as information for our hundred trillion organisms living within us. Right. They eat what we eat. They make products and metabolites that hugely influence our health. So there's a lot of ways that food has really got to be looked upon as much more uh, encompassing in terms of a health-related issue than simply breaking it down to fat, carbs, and, and uh, protein. Right. But it gets even more interesting, and you mentioned in your book as well, this might surprise some people, intermittent fasting. Uh, and not just kind of short-term fast, but also once a quarter, I think, three-day three fast, 72-hour fast. Yeah, and that builds upon what we were just talking about. Fasting is a powerful epigenetic event. In other words, when you have stopped eating, when you've cut your calories, uh, you activate some very powerful life-sustaining, life-enhancing gene pathways uh, that code for the very, very chemicals I talked about. Increased production of antioxidants, increased, increased production of a chemical called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, that gives you the growth of new brain cells, and that is by fasting. And I really think it is uh, a, a powerful event for allowing your brain to work better, turning on powerful immune systems. Uh, but also, you know, from another perspective, I think fasting is a great way to reconnect with uh, gratitude, you know, because when you break your fast and you uh, have that meal, you experience gratitude. It runs through your body, the, the gratitude that you have for the food that we have and the life and the health that we have. And that's a good thing on multiple levels. If for purposes of our discussion today, we want to look at it from a, a health beneficial perspective, 
uh, gratitude in scientific experiments has been shown to change activation of various brain regions, which ultimately code for a healthier brain. Uh, but beyond that, I think that um, there's intrinsic merit in experiencing and moreover expressing gratitude. So that's yet another wonderful benefit of saying, you know, today I'm not going to eat. Uh, the other thing it connects you with is the sense of what is called hunger. And I, I say it that way because most people have not experienced hunger in many, many years. And it's really uh, an interesting thing to make a connection back with that sense of being hungry because the answer to being hungry is to actually eat. Who knew? <laughs> so um, as a signal that it's time to eat. And I think by reestablishing connection with a sense of hunger, we reestablish our ability to know when we've eaten enough, satiety, uh, and really listening to our bodies. So it's, it's really uh, on multiple levels, I think a great choice. Now, three days might be really aggressive for many people, and I understand that. Uh, so I am suggesting that maybe, you know, on the other side of the scale, a couple of days a week, you just skip breakfast and don't eat until middle of the day. That is a bit of a fast, you know, that's a 12 to 16 hour fast, depending on when you had dinner the night before. But even that will start to stimulate those genes that are life sustaining. Yeah. And I can vouch for the fact that when I started uh, fasting as a practice, things started to change and it was, it was very noticeable. So you mentioned that food is information, but also the, the lack of food is information. Exercise is information as well. It seems like your body's always adapting to something, but most of us are adapting to the status quo. And that's a problem. You know, fasting activates uh, areas of the brain that ultimately define us as being human, like an area, I don't mean to be too technical, but the prefrontal cortex, that uh, we make a stronger connection uh, through what is called the anterior cingulate, I don't mean to be too technical, to that part of the brain that defines us as humans when we fast. And uh, as such, you know, it's interesting that all major uh, religious practices incorporate a fast as a way of reconnecting with God, whether it's the fast of Ramadan or the fast of Yom Kippur or Jesus fasting for 40 days prior to his public ministry. What an incredible benefit of, of fasting. And that is, you know, it, it makes you connect with, with whatever you choose to, to believe. So this is a non-denominational plea on my part, believe me. Right. And, uh, it, it works, but it also comes with a few, uh, there could be red flags for some people. Not everyone wants to just jump right in. So th the idea that you maybe push out breakfast to noon once or twice uh, a week is a great way to get started. And uh, I find that it's easy to get carried away with anything, but that's a great way to just kind of incorporate into your life. You're a lot like I am in that regard. You probably way overdo it, right? It's like me. Yeah. If 10 is good, well, then 100 has got to be better. So I, I get but I think you bring up a good point, and I would like to, uh, you know, just amplify that that people should certainly check with their healthcare providers prior to engaging in any type of fast. Uh, and the other thing, uh, thing is based upon their medications or underlying medical conditions. Certainly, diabetics would like to know how they're going to go about that. But I think in breaking the fast, it is really important to focus on not breaking the fast with a carbohydrate-rich meal because you pretty much will offset the benefits by doing that. If you can break your fast, whether it's just having that lunchtime uh, meal or after a day or two, with something that's pretty well based on deriving calories from fat, healthy fat, then it starts to shift your body to a place of relying upon fat as a calorie source, as opposed to continually accepting uh, carbohydrates as a, a fuel. And as such, it will stabilize energy It'll help with weight loss uh, by eating more fat, who knew? Uh, and it really is perhaps the most powerfully effective fuel uh, for wh from which you can power your brain, and that is fat. So we're trying to push the body to a low level of what is called ketosis, um, and a great way to get jump-started is to engage a fast.
Ketosis these days, especially, is a hotter and hotter term, it seems. A lot of people are confused about exactly what that means. Uh, it freaks out a lot of people when they hear it the first time or when they hear it over and over again. But most people don't realize that when they wake up in the morning, especially after a somewhat extended fast or they ate an early dinner, they're in a form of mild ketosis. It's, it's actually for the human being, the human body, a very recognizable and normal state. That's right. And I think you're probably quoting, I think, Gary Taubes when you say that. And it's a uh, you recognize that humans uh, have been in a low state of ketosis as long as we've been here. Why? Because we never had carbs. You know, we weren't walking through orange groves and picking cartons of orange juice off the tree. They didn't exist. Our diet was uh, really based upon fat and protein. And fat was a coveted a food because it's so dense in calories and has clearly other benefits in terms of how it reduces inflammation. Uh, that said, this state of ketosis is one in which our bodies are starting to mobilize fat uh, for our, from our fat storage uh, in, in the formation of what are called free fatty acids. They are processed in the liver, undergo a process called beta oxidation, and then these other fats called ketones are produced. Uh, acetoacetate, acetone, and beta-hydroxybutyrate. And I, I think that most of the attention has been on beta-hydroxybutyrate, uh, which classically is actually not a ketone. There's, there's one for you. By IUPAC um, definition, beta-hydroxybutyrate is not a ketone. But that said, we'll leave that for the, uh, that'll be the bonus question on the exam. But that said, uh, when we power our bodies with this beta-hydroxybutyrate, it's far more efficient. It produces what are called ATP molecules, the, the currency of energy, if you will, uh, much more efficiently with less production of damaging free radicals. But more importantly, when we are burning fat as a fuel source, we have a well-regulated steady state of energy provision throughout the course of our day, as opposed to when we start our day with you know, a short stack of pancakes with some syrup on it that uh, uh, the store is going to tell you is maple syrup, but you can be sure it's not. It's corn syrup with uh, coloring, uh, but anyway. And then a, maybe a glass of orange juice for yet another 36 grams of carbs. Then our insulin levels skyrocket to deal with that elevation of blood sugar. And as such, insulin comes up and the next thing you know, your blood sugar is plummeting and you feel crummy uh, by 10 o'clock in the morning and you're seeking out more sugar and carbs, uh, more coffee, uh, a cheese a Danish uh, at mid-morning as, as you're, you know, and what happens is ultimately this insulin activity does more than just deal with the blood sugar. Insulin has two major effects in, or three, in human physiology. It deals with sugar by packing it into the cells. Uh, it deals with protein synthesis, but most important for our conversation is insulin is your body's signal that winter is coming. Insulin tells your body to make and store fat by activating various enzyme pathways. So the more these insulin surges occur, the fatter you are going to become. This was a life-sustaining mechanism that allowed us to store calories in the late summer, early fall, when we had uh, a few ripened berries that we would find and we would store body fat and we made it through the winter. Why do you think uh, the bear for example, is able to make so much body fat is because it's eating berries all day long, foraging for berries and animal protein as well, and doubles its body fat but prior to hibernation. So it was a survival mechanism and it explains a couple of things. It explains why everybody, including you and I, have a sweet tooth, can't deny it. But it also really very uh, handily explains this uh, incredible epidemic of overweight and obesity that we are seeing because people are succumbing to this sweet tooth 365 days a year for winter that never comes. We also know now, based upon work that's actually been done in bears, uh, looking at their microbiome, their gut bacteria in the summer when they're adding weight, versus the winter when they are hibernating and they're using fat uh, that they've stored to power their bodies through hibernation, that there are dramatic changes in the gut bacteria that correlate with either the weight gaining state and making fat or weight losing state when you are burning f uh, fat as a fuel source. So, you know, these are other ideas that I think are really relevant as they relate to this notion of the health benefits 
of being in a low-grade ketosis. And there are even more that people may not be aware of. So this all seems like we're kind of getting back to honoring nature's laws that we've ignored for a while. That's right. You know, you said earlier uh, that just recently uh, we've done a 180, it was your words, uh, in terms of the foods that people are eating. Uh, and we've done a 180 from having done previously the 180. So 30 years ago, when we were, or, or longer, we were not as bad. We were eating pretty much along the lines of what we had been eating. Then we did the 180 based upon this notion that uh, fat is terrible. And now we're going back, we're doing the other 180 and completing the circuit, going back to uh, honoring the type of diet. Now, this is what the paleo movement is all about. It's honoring that relationship between food as information uh, and our genome being instructed by that extrinsic environmental influence called food. So this has worked and it's worked for a couple million years Uh, we've seen it not work when you look around and you walk through an airport and see a, a fairly you know, cross section of America, what people are looking like and it's scary for sure. But uh, again, rather than curse the darkness, light the candle. And here's what the candle is going to tell you. And that is getting back to the diet of our ancestors is our salvation. It's our key to health, not only from a macronutrient perspective in terms of carbs, fat and protein and the micronutrients, but also from the notion of reconnecting to our genes in a positive way. And thirdly, from the notion of nurturing our gut bacteria that then makes so many metabolic products that have a huge effect on our mood, on our neurotransmitters, our appetite, our levels of immune function and inflammation. So many um, parameters are mediated by the health of our gut bacteria. Who knew? I mean, it's a bit of a revelation. It's beautiful, though. It's it's something, and I'm glad that, uh, you know, this is your third time on the show, and it's incredible what's happened since the first in terms of popular opinion, what people are even entertaining as ideas now. Uh, and one example of that, for better or worse, is that the you mentioned paleo, and the paleo movement started out very small and niche in a lot of early adopters. And I think you and I were both kind of in, in those circles, and we still are, but it's expanded. And now what you hear, uh, if, if people are, are just you know hearing about paleo for the first time, they're putting it into action, they might be stopping at a fast food restaurant, and instead of getting the buns, they're getting three burger patties or something like that. But that is a far cry from what uh, you write in your book, what you recommend, what I recommend. And it, on the protein side, I think that's, that's where most people get a little bit carried away, especially when they first find something like paleo or ancestral health. So could you talk about your, your take on how much protein we should be eating a day? Well, I will. I mean, you bring up a very good point that this is not, uh, neither you nor I nor others, uh, you know, a advocates are recommending going literally hog wild and pounding the plate with protein. That the plate should look like, um, you know, and, and getting away from this crazy notion of a food pyramid. Let's see what your plate looks like. It's mostly filled with colorful, uh, nutrient-dense vegetables. Vegetables, fiber-rich vegetables to nurture your gut bacteria. Um, and that's what we're just beginning to understand about prebiotic fiber found in these vegetables. Uh, some fat in the form of an oil, uh, butter, olive oil, coconut oil, ghee, uh, and a protein. And I would say an animal-based protein, provided that it is, we specify that this is going to be grass-fed beef. This is going to be wild fish, uh, pasture-raised uh, chickens. You know, uh, a lot of people comment uh, in trying to refute what we talk about by saying, well, look at uh, Dr. Uh, Campbell's work, the China study. And ask, well, what do you think of that? And I will tell you that I think that was a magnificent work uh, and that his conclusions regarding eating meat at all in terms of cardiovascular disease and colon cancer are exactly on target. Now, that may be surprising to viewers of this uh, video that I would say that because, uh, you know, we're saying go ahead and eat meat, but there's a far cry difference between what we are recommending and the type of meat that people ate who were then looked upon in his statistical analysis. By and large, the type of meat that people eat today is powerfully life-threatening. And so that is where his statistics come from. And I think he's right. Uh, when you're eating grain-fed GMO uh, or glyphosate-sprayed uh, grain given to animals, 
uh, as well as uh, antibiotics to change their microbiome, this is poison. You don't want to eat that cow's meat or, or lamb or whatever it is because it will lead to problems just as Dr. Campbell described. So I think when you take a step back and, and look at this information more specifically, uh, it, it starts to make sense. Now, again, we're not, and I'm sure you're not recommending that people eat, you know, go to and order a plate full of beef, that's what your dinner should be. It'd be the worst thing for you to have uh, the, the beef or the pork, whatever it is, relegated to being the side dish or even the condiment is what you know, cultures have done traditionally. So I think we really got to back down and recognize that you know, we're deriving calories from fat and to a lesser extent from protein and to an even lesser extent from the carbohydrates that we're consuming, uh, but that we've got to back down for a number of reasons. First, what we do understand is if you're gonna be eating too much protein and you are um, you know, hoping to become uh, keto in ketosis, it's not gonna work because what your body's gonna activate is a process called gluco, meaning sugar, neo, new, genesis meaning your body's going to make new sugar out of the amino acids that are now so readily available because you're eating too much protein. So, uh, you know, there are various formulas I like about uh, 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram of ideal body weight. It's a simple formula. It, if you're weight training, you probably need uh, more. If you're, uh, you're recovering from an injury and you're lying in a hospital bed all day, maybe you need a little bit less. But but I think by and large, people are eating too much protein and, I, and I'm grateful uh, for you giving me the opportunity to make that point about what our programs talk about. And it is not about loading up with meat day in and day out. It is not you know, um, what some people consider to be the Atkins program uh, where you're just focused on any kind of meat. Uh, you mentioned going to the fast food and getting you know, three meat patties. Not that at all. It's restricting and being very selective about those choices that you make. Yeah. So getting better meat, the highest quality meat you can find and afford, and just eating less of it, and then bumping up the veggies and bumping up the good fats. That's right. And, you know, I, I believe in these days of significant uh, stress to our bodies based upon our changed environment and our toxic environment, that there is even a place for supplementation of various types whether it's probiotics, prebiotic fiber, magnesium, vitamin D, DHA. I think that in an ideal world, which would be probably you know, greater than 10,000 years ago, uh, those things might not have been necessary. We wouldn't need vitamin D if we were all outside, no clothes on, walking around in the sunshine all day long. Well, that's not what we do. So um, you know, we need magnesium because these vegetables that we are eating are devoid of magnesium now because where would they get it from? The soil doesn't contain much trace minerals anymore. And magnesium is critically important, perhaps one of the most important minerals that we can get. DHA that you get from krill oil or fish oil is so fundamentally important for the brain. And I think there is now you know, great science indicating that both prebiotic fiber supplementation and even taking a really powerful probiotic, it makes sense. And, and mostly because of its ability to reduce that powerful mechanism that underlies all of our chronic degenerative conditions, and that is inflammation. Mm -hmm. And you've had personal experience with that lately. So let's raise the stakes a little bit because I think people hear, you know, I should eat this way, I should be healthy, maybe I should lose a few pounds. But no, you could actually lose your brain, you could lose who you are, you could lose your life. Oh, that's right. And um, that is the purpose, really, of my new book. And that is, uh, you know, Grain Brain and Brain Maker really we're more focused on the why. You know, what is the science behind why we say low carb and higher fat? What is the science that begins to connect us to the health of our microbiome? And the new book is much more about a how. How do you implement now? What do you do with this information in terms of uh, your choices for exercise, diet, how you sleep, how you express gratitude? Uh, medications that you might reconsider taking once you understand what they're doing to you, uh, supplements that are, in my opinion, important for you based upon uh, what our needs are. But it's much more about that. Um, it's about um, how do you really do this day in and day out. And written from my perspective as a now 61-year-old uh, individual who is at risk for every disease like everybody else, 
and probably at increased risk for Alzheimer's because my father died of that disease. So I wrote this book more from my perspective about, hey, what is it like to live this life where you know you're not likely going to get Alzheimer's, though you may have inherited an increased risk, how do you offset a genetic predisposition by making lifestyle changes? So that's what, uh, it's a different perspective this time around. And I just um, recorded a, a new public television program that'll air uh, pretty soon. And it is really kind of focused on this as well. It's really me just being as uh, transparent as I can. Here I am, judge me if you wish. Uh, this is what I've learned, this is how I do it. And what my experiences have been that have really kind of enhanced my dedication to this program. Yeah. What are some early warning signs if people are listening out there uh, and, and they think they may, might have a bit of brain fog or other issues? How could you see some of this kind of creeping up so that you can nip it in the butt? People call these events senior moments to make light of them. And I think that's uh, a, a little bit of a... Um, uh, it's going to lead people, and I know this is why you asked the question, to maybe not take them as seriously. But, uh, you know, when you're having to run the list of your children's name until you finally got the right one and stop on that name, uh, and that may include the dog, uh, you know, uh, going into a room and not remembering why you did so. Um, maybe I guess it's acceptable to from time to time forget the Wi-Fi code if you haven't ever reset it and it's about 15 characters long. I guess we can let that one go. Yeah. But, um, you know, certainly things uh, more importantly, like um, getting lost, uh, forgetting, uh, you know, where you keep putting things and it's getting worse. These are all not uh, to be laughed at and, and looked upon as being senior moments. Uh, you know, the big elephant in the room here that I haven't mentioned, of course, is that this, these are harbingers for dementia. And the most common form of dementia is senile dementia of the Alzheimer's type, so Alzheimer's disease. Are you at risk for that? Well, if you live to be age 85, your risk is 50-50. That becomes epidemic. Uh, the 85-year-old uh, and older group is the largest uh, group in terms of uh, expansion or increase uh, in our population. They're growing much more readily and uh, quickly than other age groups. So it's a huge issue. There are 5.4 million Americans already been, have been given the diagnosis. Uh, about 47 million people worldwide. And this is by and large a preventable disease. I mean, just so there's no misunderstanding, Alzheimer's is by and large preventable. Moreover, it is a disease for which we have no meaningful treatment at all whatsoever, Abel, James, as we have this conversation. You know, we read the, uh, all the literature and the news about, oh, this new discovery and uh, this company is making this drug and they hope it's gonna work. That hasn't happened and it's not going to happen anytime soon. So, you know, John Kennedy said the time to fix the roof is when the sun is shining. And I think now that we understand, for example, that simple aerobic exercise powerfully augments the growth of new brain cells. And in a study recently published at UCLA has been shown to be associated with a 50% reduced risk for Alzheimer's. That means you've got to go out and buy a very expensive piece of equipment called a pair of sneakers. And that is your medicine that is now demonstrated to be associated with a 50% reduced risk for a disease for which there is no treatment. And the other really important thing to consider is that if you become a type two diabetic, you have likely quadrupled your risk for Alzheimer's. So, all the talk about diabetes is interesting. You know, it goes along with the obesity conversation, changes in the microbiome, et cetera. But the answer is not to treat your blood sugar by taking a medication. That may happen. But the answer to our discussion is to prevent diabetes in the first place because diabetes is type two diabetes is by and large a choice. It is a lifestyle choice, meaning that if you become a type two diabetic, it is based upon your lifestyle choices, you have chosen to quadruple your risk for Alzheimer's disease. Now, I don't wanna sound uh, mean and aggressive, but I'm the guy who receives these patients now who are having the very complaints that you just mentioned. And truthfully, you know, there are things that we can do, but if we can keep people healthy cognitively uh, at the beginning, uh, it's going to go a long way. I mean, it's been estimated uh, that 
you know, there may be as many as 100 million uh, Americans that are pre-diabetic. And that's a very large statistic, meaning, you know, that's almost a third of our population. Uh, it's scary. But um, the, my concern is, you know, of course, it relates to, to renal disease and uh, coronary artery disease, cancer as well, uh, but also Alzheimer's. So we've got to pay strict attention to that. And we need to remind ourselves that because there's such a temptation to be afraid of sharks <laughs> and other things that are so much more, I, I guess, in tune with our, our primal brain, the lower levels of the brain, which are just afraid of snakes and tigers and that sort of thing. But those looming dark fears later on in life, they're hard to conceptualize for most people. Is there anything else that you, that you can do or, or people can do at home who are listening right now to really connect those dots, to make sure that when the rubber meets the road, when you're making your plate, when you're putting on your sneakers, you're doing the right thing? Well, let me just emphasize then one more point, and that is if the time comes, and as I mentioned, if you live to be age 85, you flip a coin to determine if that's going to be you or not. Yeah. But you end up in the doctor's office and, and you say to her or him, um, I'm not uh, as sharp as I used to be, my memory is failing. There is nothing that can be done for you at that point in mainstream medicine. I wish there were. I would have used medicines with my father had they been available. They are not even available now. So the plea is that, um, you know, it's coming. We're all getting older and our risk for these issues are uh, is increasing. And so um, prevention is uh, the ultimate principle of wisdom. Uh, to cure a disease after it has manifest is like digging a well when one feels thirsty or forging weapons when the war has already begun. That comes to us from the Neijing, the Yellow Emperor, 400 BC. So that's ancient wisdom that we've got to emphasize prevention and keeping people healthy right now. And it even goes beyond reducing our risk for these potentially devastating conditions. It also speaks towards the notion of enhancing brain function today, making your brain um, you know, work uh, better and sharper and uh, more efficiently so we can be we can be more successful at whatever it is we want to do. No matter what you do in life, uh, you got to have a pretty sharp computer upstairs or you won't be as productive and effective. So, you know, no matter what job you have, if your brain's working better uh, or even beyond your job, however you choose to enjoy your life, you, you know, if you can enhance the your RAM capacity of your laptop and your brain, then life is going to be a better place for you, a better experience for you. And at the same time, you're going to reduce your risk uh, for Alzheimer's, which is such a devastating situation, not just for the patient. Frankly, you know, the patient is probably the least effective, affected in terms of uh, who gets involved with this emotionally. I mean, I've been there. It's the family. It's the loved ones who are just, uh, you know, devastated. And, uh, and then... They want to know. I mean, a day in and day out, ask me, no, Doc, I don't want to end up like mom or dad. What should I be doing? And there's another piece of all of this as well that you experienced firsthand, and that's that stress, the the lifestyle factor that everyone everyone wants to glaze over. That and sleep are, are huge wins if you can dial them in, but it takes keeping your eye on the ball. So stress, you might be thinking about that a bit differently now than in the years past, because you're not only type A, but you're also a doctor and a super high achiever, and you want to help the world and constantly work as hard as you can. But being truly healthy means tapping the gas every once in a while, too. Yeah, and uh, I guess I am type A. I, you said that, I don't think I didn't hear it, but I guess I am. Uh, Anyway, but uh, you're right. Uh, stress is a major factor, especially long-term ongoing stress changes the gut bacteria, increases permeability of the gut lining, leading to increased inflammation. And that elevated cortisol is very damaging to your brain's memory center. Um, I generally live a very low stress life, uh, real careful with myself, but you know, uh, at times things uh, occur that you can't necessarily control. And as I talked about in the book, um, I had to deal with the loss of a friend over a, about a 12 hour period. He had a sudden uh, hemorrhage into his brain. And oh, during those 12 hours, while uh, you know I was waiting for all the family members to arrive into the intensive care unit, I was the neurologist. I was not the best friend. Uh, this is a man who married my wife and me. Uh, he was the godfather of our daughter, very, very close. Uh, 
close individual to us. And, uh, you know, to have to extubate him, take him off of life support at midnight and then explain to the family that he had gone, uh, it was very, very tough for me. Um, you know, I, as a doctor, I was able to do that for years and years, but, you know, this was a different scenario. So following that event, the next day I did not feel well. That night I felt very, very sick, uh, probably sicker than I've ever felt in my life and uh, in every way. <laughs> top and bottom. So the next day I got a phone call from his wife saying, can you collect up some pictures and video of Uncle Mike is what we called him for a a memorial service. And I went on the computer and I I booted up a video of our band uh, playing. Uh, We were doing a benefit concert and there he was singing. And I saw that and I had to lie down on the couch and my wife came in and I must, I must have looked a sight, as they say. And she said, I'm gonna take you to the hospital, which don't ever say that to me because I will never ever go to the hospital. I mean, I had a fish hook in the back of my head and I said, I'll get it out with a pair of needle nose pliers. Anyway, she said, I'm taking you to the hospital. And I said, no, you're not. And she thought I was being stubborn. I said, you need to call an ambulance right now. That's how I felt. And that's not who I am. Uh, and the ambulance, picked me up and I had a heart rate of over 180 in atrial fibrillation and they blasted me with medicines in the intensive care unit and they couldn't break it. And, uh, you know, they're getting charging up the paddles to shock my heart back into rhythm. And, you know, I'm, I'm a healthy guy and, uh, it was a bit of a shock what stress can do to you. Um, but I have to admit that after everybody had left the ICU and I was just one-on-one with the, the nurse and he was explaining his life, I felt this sudden wave of gratitude to this person, a complete stranger, just for the care that he was rendering for me. I had this love for him. And at that moment, this wave passed over me and my heart rhythm immediately converted right back to normal rhythm, but the rate was still a little bit elevated. And throughout the course of the night, my rate got lower and lower. And I started to say, you know, my heart rate's only pretty low. You gotta go easy on that medication because I'm a runner. And uh, finally I dozed off and when I woke up, I looked over at the monitor and I had flatlined. I had no uh, heartbeat, which is uh, (laughs) kind of a strange place to be. Yeah. And uh, I closed my eyes thinking I had to be dreaming, but I looked over at the monitor again and again, no heartbeat. So I I said, well, I guess this is when I'm supposed to float over the bed and all these things and every, and, But actually what I did was I traced the EKG leads and found that one had popped off my chest. I connected it back up and of course my heartbeat was fine. Then I had a full workup, echo, stress echo. They took me up to 180 on the treadmill. The guy said, my gosh, you're like you're 16 years old. So I was was fine. But um, again, uh, this book, uh, that story is in my new book because I think it's really important as you and I discussed before we went on, on to record this today, Um, that people recognize that, you know, it's one thing to stand on high and give advice. It's certainly quite another to be transparent and be on the same side as everybody else. And that's what this is about, that I'm learning as much as I can and then sharing as much as I can um, from the perspective of being on the same side of this as everybody else. And I think it feels really good for me to be speaking uh, in this way. Yeah. And we're all in this together. And at some point we need all hands on deck. I think we're getting to that point. Right. But what was, if you could clarify a little bit, the moment that something changed, it it sounds like when you were talking to the person who was attending to you in the hospital, uh, you were able to let go of something. Um, All of us have gone through some sort of tragedy or or traumatic event or, or, or grief. Is there any, any words of wisdom you could, you could use to help others get out of that state? Well, just to go back um, to that moment of letting go, many people, including my wife, uh, have told me that that what I was letting go of at that moment was uh, letting go of Mike and letting him go, that I had held on to him. You know, my best friend, I will do anything to keep you and, and keep you safe. And um, I needed to let go of him. You know, the whole family was processing the fact that he had died and I was acting as a, the, the neurologist going through the steps that I should go through. And I had, ne- I had not processed the fact that he had gone. And that may well have been what happened to me at about 9.30 that night that I finally relinquished 
holding on to uh, my best friend and uh, letting it go. And then the manifestation was my heart rate saying, okay, yeah. we're back to where we used to be. Um, you know, you did what you needed to do. Uh, so I think that it's, it's maybe a lesson for others. That's why I put it in my book. I'm hoping it's a lesson for others about letting go of things that are, are so uh, difficult for us. And, you know, moving on uh, with love in our hearts that we did the best we could in whatever the situation was, whether uh, it's a marital relationship or something that we did that wasn't what we wanted to have done, let it go and realize we're all human and, and move forward. It was a very good lesson for me. So again, <laughs> I, I write this book now uh, from the perspective of the lessons I've learned, but the lessons that I continue to learn day in and day out being human based upon, uh, you know, looked at through the lens of the science that formed the backbone of my previous books. You know, now people get that. They understand the low carb, the gluten, the microbiome, um, the importance of healthy fats, what good bacteria do for us. All right. Now we look at that uh, information and we leverage it into a plan but that plan also includes exercise, it includes sleep, and it includes the powerful effects on your health of expressing gratitude. Gratitude is not looked upon as being something you would find in a health-related or a medical book. But um, hey, that's, that's who I am now, and that's why we include it, because it's really one of the four pillars, in my opinion. I can't believe it, but we are coming up on time. Before we go, I want to make sure that, that we mention one beautiful thing that I that I found in your book, Dr. Perlmutter, was something, uh, I think you called it morning quotes that you read with your wife, which is basically something, it's, it's like a thought for the day. Is there, could you explain that practice, why you do it, and, uh, and maybe share a quote that stands out to you recently? Sure. Um, we, in the morning, uh, have a reading. Uh, oftentimes, it's a, it's a, you know, a, a much more uh, uh, intense, not intense, but lengthy inspirational reading from all kinds of sources. And again, this is non-denominational. It might be from the Bible. It might be from Helen Keller. It might be from Steve Martin. I mean, who? It, it's, it's as diverse as can be. And then, you know, we like to look at a, a sentence or two uh, from uh, people uh, that then we will deal with uh, or, or, you know, run, ruminate over during the course of the day. And, um, you know, whether it deals with gratitude or kindness or acceptance, uh, you know, the, and that's why I actually, here's a book about health. I included that in, in the book as well. I even, I even went so far as to include, you know, obviously there's a section on exercise. And then I went to a, um, a gym uh, Equinox Gym in New York and recorded myself doing those exercises and posted them online showing you, hey, here I'm doing the best I can. Uh, you know, I'm not competing in the Olympics. Neither are you. Or you might be. But uh, but this is how I do it. This is how I think is an important way to uh, do a sit up, uh, to do strengthen your upper body, your legs, etc. So it's really all about what I found works for me um, and is working for me. Uh, hopefully, you know, in three years when Abel James has him back on the show, we will again see uh, what dedication to these principles has done for me. And then, you know, your viewers can uh, in, can feel whether is, is that right for them or not. Well, Dr. Perlmutter, you do terrific work. I, uh, I'm, I'm, I think your new book, I was very much encouraged reading it because it's right on point. I think it's what people need to read right now. So could you tell the folks who are listening a little bit more about your work and where to find you? Well, the new book is called The Grain Brain Whole Life Plan. And uh, I am uh, I post every day on Facebook, which is David Perlmutter, MD. Uh, we have a very, very robust website, which is highly searchable with the actual full PDF articles of many of the scientific studies that we quote. And that is drperlmutter.com, drperlmutter.com. Um, and we have focus areas for things like autism and Alzheimer's. And uh, these are areas where we've collected the various videos that I've done, interviews, as well as blogs that I've written, as well as research papers. So these are focus areas. So it's all about uh, information. It's there for everybody. And spend a lot of time on the site. Get as much information as you want. My blogs are free for anyone to use and copy, do whatever you want with them. Works for me. 
that's the mission here. And uh, so again, David Perlmutter, MD on Facebook, and the uh, website is drperlmutter.com. Um, public television, I found, is a great uh, avenue for me in terms of being able to spend an hour with people or longer and, and get my message out. So um, that's where you'll find me. And of course, uh, Abel James always does a great job. So thank you for that. Thank you, Dr. Perlmutter. You're doing great work. I encourage all of you listeners to check out his new book. Thanks so much for coming on the show. You're welcome anytime. Thank you. Good to see you. Thanks again for listening to Fat Burning Man. Don't forget, before you go, check out fatburningtribe.com. If you have a question for me that you want answered about how to improve your performance, what to eat for dinner, how to drop fat quickly, how to improve your overall health, or anything else, we answer all of your questions there. So quickly, you can get the first month for just $1 for a limited time. Check it out at fatburningtribe.com. All right, I'll see you there. Before you go, don't forget to grab your listener discount on our 30-day fat loss plan. In this plan, we share 30 days of mouth-watering wild diet meal plans that are designed to help you drop fat with real food. The meal plans are paleo-friendly, easy to make, and literally the meals that my wife Allison and I eat just about every day and night to stay lean, fit, and happy. In the program, you'll get the most effective method of meal and nutrient timing to best stimulate fat loss and muscle recovery, the truth about how much protein you really need for your body type, 30 days of specific healthy fat-burning meal plans as a done-for-you nutrition strategy, and tons more. If you check it out today, you'll even get a listener discount. All you have to do is type in fatburningman.com forward slash 30 days. That's the number 30, D-A-Y-S. Once again, that's fatburningman.com forward slash 30 days. I'll see you there. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Fat Burning Man. If you liked it, don't forget to hit the subscribe button on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, the podcast app, or wherever else you might be listening to or watching this show. Got a second? please leave me a quick review on iTunes. I always love hearing from you. And if you think someone else might like and benefit from this free show, please take a second to share it with a friend or with a family member. You can get in touch with me on Twitter at FatBurnMan and Facebook by typing in Abel James or FatBurningMan. Drop me a line anytime. Did you know that I've recorded over 150 episodes of Fat Burning Man, winning four awards in independent media and hitting number one in more than eight countries? And here's some more good news. You can download and listen to every single episode for free. All you have to do is type in fatburningman.com. I'll give you a second to type it in, fatburningman.com. And you'll get all the show notes in video and audio versions for all the past episodes of Fat Burning Man. Better yet, enter your best email at fatburningman.com, sign up for my newsletter, and I'll even send you a quick start guide to start burning fat right now and a few of our ridiculously tasty recipes as a special thanks for signing up. Once again, just go to fatburningman.com right now, enter your best email to get your free fat burning downloads straight to your inbox and make sure that you never miss a show again. This is Abel James signing off. Thanks so much for listening and have a great week.